hey, it's Nathan. I'm here in the uh, the Twitch setup today because I wanted to go ahead and document an academic talk that I gave last week, uh, specifically on April 8th, 2022, um, in the Dynamical System Seminar at my institution. Um, here is the whole um, abstract of the talk. Um, so if you're interested, I will just go ahead and read this and you can stick around and I will put the, um, it's not going to be cut up a ton, but just like m trimmed uh, Twitch stream uh, that I did to record me giving a talk f so that I could document it on YouTube. Um, so in particular, I give a talk on factors of symbolic dynamical systems, the Curtis Hedlund -Linden, Linden theorem. And... The abstract is as follows. Understanding the structure of factor maps for a category of dynamical systems is important for understanding the relationship between dynamical properties of objects within that category. In the case of finite alphabet symbolic dynamics, the Curtis Hedlund Linden theorem, a fundamental result in the study of symbolic dynamics, gives a complete description of these factor maps for the symbolic dynamics of a group G over some alphabet A. In this talk, we go through the argument of the theorem, make connections to the widely studied case where G is the group of the integers, and then if time allows, present a counterexample to the theorem in the case of an infinite alphabet. So um, again, uh, this was just an expository talk that I did off of some um, material that I was interested in and had been reading about um, in tandem with some other stuff that I've been doing this semester. Uh, and I've included some more resources and links and um, cited some sources for this talk in the description below. Otherwise, without further ado, uh, I'm going to go ahead and cut to the beginning where I ended up writing um, all of this stuff on screen and talking through exactly uh, what that abstract was getting at so there's that thanks for thanks for stopping by even if you don't watch the whole thing and i will see you in a, in five seconds all right so hi everyone i am nathan delacles i'm going to talk to you about uh factors of symbolic dynamical systems in particular the curtis headland linden theorem uh the, this theorem is a fundamental result in symbolic dynamics that describes factor maps and a large a, a large uh, set of scenarios where you're working with different uh, symbolic systems and you're mapping from one symbolic system of a certain type to another. Uh, and in order to talk about the objects that make these factor maps work the way they do, um, I need to go ahead and define things in general because I'm going to talk about this as um, working over a general group instead of what most are used to or have are more familiar with when working with symbolic dynamics is just the group of the integers. So um, to start off, I'm going to start with a definition, um, which is just what does it mean to shift? Right. So um, the shift action of a group G on this space, this AG, where A to the G or the space of symbolic points is the set of functions uh, from G to A is defined by the action of an element G on X in position H, or rather the thing that we label the, um, the image of X under the action by the element G uh, at H is going to be equal to, by definition, the same thing that we labeled X with, or that we labeled um, G minus, or sorry, the same thing that we lab labeled G inverse H um, with an X. And this is for every, G and H within the group, and for every X within the symbolic space H to the G. So the example, right, is you can just think of the integers. So if the group is just the integers, so your positive and negative natural numbers and zero, um, 
and your alphabet is a binary alphabet, so zero and one, and you take x to be this point, and I'm gonna write it a little weird, but it's just going to be zero, one, infinitely repeating to the left, and then zero, one, infinitely repeating to the right, then if g is equal to one, then, uh, uh, then, well, x is going to look like so. So it'll be zero, one, forever, doing the same thing over and over again. And you'll get to one thing and you'll reach the center of the point and then you'll continue on in the other direction forever. And it'll be zero, one, over and over again. Uh, the decimal point marks the center of the symbolic point. So this is just the place where we've labeled the element uh, h is equal to zero with something from our binary alphabet. And then the action of g on uh, the symbolic space uh, in terms of just the element g, which in this case is the identity of the group one acting on the point x, is going to just move this point over to the left one. So have all of the stuff same as before, but instead we will end at zero and then one will be the new the new thing next to the center uh, and we will go forward from there. So then we get just one zero repeating over and over and over again. So here g inverse um, h, g inverse h is equal to negative one plus zero, which is negative one, right? So we've got uh, the thing that we labeled zero with was the thing that we labeled um, minus one with before. So this is just showing an example of the definition. Um, essentially, the important thing to note here is that uh, essentially the action of g on the, this element g on the integers is the left shift map. So uh, in particular, g is essentially sigma inverse, which is the left shift map left shift map from the symbolic space to itself. Um, so I have defined how we're going to shift about using the group G so we can talk about things in more generality than just with the integers where shift invariance is just with invariance with respect to sigma. Um, so we can talk about invariance with any respect to any element in G. And if you're thinking about the integers, then respect to any element in G is just the powers of the invariance with respect to powers of the shift map anyway. So now I've now that we have the shift action, we have uh, how we shift through our symbolic points on a general group G. And the next thing I'm going to define is the object that gives us those con those continuous G G equivariant or shift invariant um, maps between a symbolic space and itself. So for finite for finite alphabet symbolic dynamics. So this is another definition. So a cellular automata or automaton cellular automaton. over a group G and an alphabet fancy A is a map tough from symbolic space over that Symbolic space. Um, sorry, it, it's a it's a map um, from the symbolic space to itself, uh, such that 
there exists an S, which is a subset of the group, not a it doesn't need, it does not need to be a subgroup, uh, such that that S is finite, and there exists a map phi, which goes from this the labelings of that set S by elements of our alphabet A, just make it fancy, um, to the alphabet such that we can determine the image of the automaton at a group element uh, by just what happens to the original point X when it's acted on by the inverse of G, um, and then when that's just restricted to the finite set. So I'll give an example here in a second. So, um, but first, just terminology-wise, we say that um, this S here, this S here is um, called the memory set, or a memory set for TOF. So, okay. Example, um, let me do a different color for this. So example, the most famous example probably of a cellular automaton is Conway's Game of Life. And this is the first place where we're, where we're going to, well, I guess this is uh, one of the places where I'm going to give an example that's not in terms of the integers, but instead it's going to be in terms of something slightly more general, but not uh, as wild as it could be. So right, so your group here is going to be the integer lattice, or z squared, and your memory set is going to be 0 and plus or minus 1 squared. So what this looks like is if you want to go ahead and figure out what happens at, let's say, a, B, under, um, under the cellular automaton, well, um, let's say this is a point, well, since we're in the lattice, we can think about, about this as like a nine by nine, or a three by three grid, rather. Right? So we've got some square of stuff that's filled with zeros and ones, right? That's our alphabet, I should say that as well. So our alphabet is binary still. So at each point in the integer lattice, so at some A, B, you have a labeling of a zero or one. And the memory set that you need in order to figure out what the cellular automaton does uh, at this particular coordinate um, or this particular group element um, is that three by three box that surrounds that a b um, and in particular how you would think about figuring out what happens there is that you would go ahead and map this back to the origin because we're going to act by the inverse of uh, the point of uh, the group element a b so minus a minus b in this case to pull you back to the origin to look at what hap what the labeling of that acted point would be or uh, and then after you have that you would go ahead and map that over with your finite uh, local rule which is given by that phi map um, to get a symbol at um, a b. So in order to in order to determine what happens in the image of the automaton, I need to know what happens in a in a three by three square about that point in the automaton, right? So I don't actually need to go do this pre-image operation. Instead, I can think of also as just looking at x restricted to g. Um, the G translation of that memory set, right? Which this would, in this case, it would be this three by three square would be our um, A, B, S would be that translation of the memory set by A, B. And the memory set would be down here, S, um, which is equal to, again, zero plus or minus one squared. Finally, um, this phi map is given by something that's it's actually kind of gross to write out for Conway's Game of Life if you do it in summation notation. There's the, like if you Google Conway's Game of Life rules, you'll get the list of four rules that are standard for 
or four or five rules that are standard for Conway's Game of Life. However, um, I'm going to write it out in summation notation. So if you look at the image of a pattern under the finite local rule, right? So this takes in things that are, are configurations on th three by three squares. Um, you're going to go ahead and get, well, big, so I have room. It's going to be zero if the sum over the things that are not the center of that configuration is, oh, uh, I want phi. phi, I want the patterns labeling of S. So if you add up all of the symbols that have been labeled in the square surrounding your origin, that's going to be less than two or less than, or greater than three rather. Um, for your pattern being labeled with a one in the center. And then it'll be a one, and then this rule is a little bit more complicated. So if the sum of the labelings about your place of interest is in two or three, so it's in the set of two or three, so pattern labeling at point S, is going to be within the set two or three for P of zero, zero, the thing at the center being equal to one, or the sum of that stuff minus S, ooh, within S minus, come on, I can do this, minus zero, zero, have the pattern at S, It's going to be equal to th equal three. Yeah, yeah. So if the sum of the labelings around your place of interest is three um, for the pattern at uh, evaluated at zero zero is equal to zero. So if you are you are dead and the sum of the surrounding things is three, then you become alive. If you are alive and the sum of the surrounding things is two or three, then you stay alive. And then if you uh, are alive and the sum is either under two or you're underpopulated, or if it's over three or if you're overpopulated, then you die. Right? So you go from one to zero. Um, so these are the two, these are. This is the object of interest for this talk. This is what's going to end up giving us um, the answer to the question of what are um, the factor maps between uh, symbolic dynamical spaces in the finite alphabet case, as described by the Curtis Headland Linden theorem. Uh, but I need to do a little bit of work in order to make that clear. So, this is the first uh, proposition that I'll prove during this talk. So, um, there'll be two propositions, and then I think I just go. Go for the jugular. Yeah, we'll do do two small propositions, and then we'll talk about the Curtis and Lindman theorem. So first off, is that we'll call this Prop A. Um, let G be a group, and let A be a set. Then every cellular automaton toff from the symbol space to itself is G equivariant. And so when I say G equivariant, the idea here is that it's 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 shift invariant with respect to the, the left shift action. Um, so this is actually very quick. Uh, so the proof of this goes through very nicely. Um, so we go ahead and let S be a memory set for the automaton tau or TOF. Um, 
and because we're a cellular automaton, we have a finite local role. So V from the restriction to that memory set to A, B, a finite local role. For TOF, then for every G and H within G, and x within the symbol space, we have that. Well, if I look at the automaton applied to g acting on an element x, at h, that's going to be the same thing as the finite local rule applied to h inverse. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, h inverse g dot x by definition, right? So restricting to s, right? Yeah, yep, right here, right here. That's what we're using right here. Just the definition of cellular automaton, and then we can rewrite that as the inverse of G inverse H acting on X restricted to S. But then that is just how of X G evaluated at G inverse H. But then by definition of the left shift action of G, that's just G acting on tau of X and then evaluated at H. So you can, so essentially so actions by elements of the group G and the map tau commute so uh, tau is equi uh, G equivariant or tof is G equivariant so thus tof is G equivariant Next uh, prop is about Continuity. So prop B takes a little bit more time, but is not as bad. Uh, is not too bad either. So let G be a group um, and A be a set. And then uh, and every cellular automaton from the symbol space to itself is continuous. So I have to be careful here. So I have to just just comment on the fact that when I'm talking about the symbols, when I'm talking about the symbol space, I'm talking about the um, the topology that I'm talking about is the pro-discrete topology. So your basic open sets are your um, pre-images of your projection maps uh, intersected with each other over a finite set. Um, so in particular, uh, we go ahead and let uh, S be a memory set for TOF, and we let um, X be within symbol space with w being an open neighborhood about x an open neighborhood about x in the pro discrete topology on the symbol space. Then, so by definition of open in the pro-discrete topology on the symbol space, then there exists K, which is finite, such that 
x is going to be within some basic open set which is defined by k. So k is, is first off, it's a subset of the group. Not necessarily a subgroup, it's just a subset of the group. Um, so for all of the, so b is going to be the set of all of the things which agree with x at the coordinate g. And that's going to be a subset of w. We can do this because we're in the pro discrete topology for each. So each thing that we're taking a product of is discrete, so everything is open in each one of those sets in that product. Uh, in particular, it's a g-fold product of, of the alphabet or finite set A. Uh, well, yeah, it's a g-fold product of the, of the set A in this case, because I don't actually require it to be finite here either. So in particular, this intersection is, again, it's just the intersection of all things um, or all sets of things such that they agree at the gth coordinate. Oh, I don't know why I wrote it that way. The y of g is equal to um, x of g. So in particular, if we go ahead and consider, consider The product of k and s. So this is the group theoretic product, um, which is equal to the set of products k and s such that k is within k and s is within s. Um, the first thing to note here is that this is a potentially larger set than k, and that's what we want. Um, it's also a potentially larger set than s, um, which is also nice, but I don't think it's necessary here. Um, and the reason you can get this is from just the the what is it called? There's a combinatorial name for it. The thing from group theory where you look at the size of the, uh, the group theoretic product of sets, and that's just going to be equal to uh, the size of each individual set uh, divided by the size of their intersection. Um, and then their intersection is so the intersection is um, larger in, is um, at least, oh, I'm sorry, the intersection is at most as big as the minimum of the two sets. So this is um, greater than or equal to uh, k times s over the minimum of the size of k or the size of s. Because I'm making because I'm making the bottom thing smaller, so I'm going to get a bigger thing out top. So and then that means that this is uh, greater than um, k, and it's greater than s, or greater than or equal to, right? Because um, it could be could be greater than or equal to either one, it, but it's strictly one of them. Oh well, nah, I don't want to say strictly. Anyway, so the the reason for this is because I'm going to use this to make a smaller set and in order to make a smaller intersection I need to make an intersection of more things so um, in particular if we look at what happens uh, with a point so if y within symbol space agrees with x on the group theoretic product ks then for every k within k the image of the automaton on y evaluated at k is going to be equal to the local map applied to k inverse acting on y restricted to s. But this thing is just by a previous note from earlier in the talk is this guy, right? So if I go back up here, um, I didn't have to move. I didn't have to move this nine, uh, three by three square to the origin to figure out what was in it. I moved it back there to use the definition of the map. But I could have just defined the map where I was restricting x to, um, again, g times 
the set, which uh, which is what I put here, right? So I, I can think about it this way, where I'm restricting the point to the translation of that memory set by the element G. And so here I can think about this thing exact, is exactly just this. And similarly, instead of thinking about it in the translation, I, since they agree on the group theoretic product of K and S, uh, this is equal to what X has at those locations as well. And so that means that this thing is equal to the local map applied to the inverse image of K acting on X restricted to S. And that is equal to tau of X K, evaluated at K. So in particular, so uh, tau of y agrees with tau x on k. And so if I take the image of the intersection g within ks of the stuff that agrees with x on g, then that is a subset of the stuff we had earlier, of the stuff um, where um, that agrees with x on k. And that's going to be a subset of w. Yeah, so if I take the, again, so if I take the stuff that agrees with x on the set ks, and I take its image under the automaton, then that's going to be a subset of the stuff that agrees with x on just k. And so that will be a subset of the open set w. And so hence tau is continuous. So there's another proof done. I boxed that one as well. All right, so um, for prop A and prop B, the two things to note here is that in neither case, so in neither case, in neither case, did we require anything of the alphabet. A, right? So prop A and prop B hold when your alphabet is larger than finite. So you can then ask, well, are these actually the right things to think about? Are these cellular automaton, are they the right things to think about when going backwards? So if you have a continuous and G equivariant map, is it a cellular automaton uh, for finite state sim uh, for finite state or finite alphabet symbolic dynamics? The answer is yes, and so that brings us to the main theorem for this expository talk uh, is the Curtis Hedlund Linden theorem. The theorem um, Curtis Hedlund Linden. theorem. So uh, let G, uh, well first off, um, this theorem was uh, published by Hedlund in a paper in uh, 1969, so 1969 by Hedlund, and he credited uh, Curtis and Linden as co-discoverers of the theorem. When he originally proved it, he only proved it for the integers, um, which will be, uh, is a much more restricted case than the way I will present it in this talk. Um, and later on, Richardson, um, Richardson later showed it um, for the integer lattice uh, ZD uh, in 1972. 
Uh, and since then, it has been uh, further generalized into the argument that I am going to give here. So um, let G be a group. And let A be a finite set. So in this case, I am requiring that the alphabet A be finite. Let tau be a continuous G equivariant map. and equipped symbolic space with the pro-discrete topology then the following are equivalent one, tau is, or toff is, a cellular automaton. And two, is that toff is, oh, I didn't want to say that tau is a, that's, that's a mistake on my part. So uh, I don't need, I just need, tau being a map, because I'm going to say it's continuous and G equivariant in the following equipment, our equivalent statement. So tau is a map uh, from the symbol space to itself. In the following equivalent, tau is a cellular automaton and tau is, or tau is a um, continuous G equivariant map. So, oh, proof of this thing, right? So in this case, right, I do require that the alphabet is finite. And the reason for that is I'm going to do basically a compactness argument. Um, so one implies two, we already did. From prop A and B. And then two implies one is where the work comes in. So for two implies one, uh, suppose um, suppose that you have some continuous G equivariant map. And so um, since the map phi, which goes from the symbol space onto the alphabet A, defined by phi of x is equal to top of x evaluated at one at the identity at the identity of G. So again, this is the identity of G. It is not the characteristic function of G. It's the identity of G, um, and that's just equal to well, you're going to project onto the identity of G whatever um, the automaton spits out. Or you're going to look at the label of whatever the automaton spits out at one G. This is a composition of continuous maps because the pro-discrete topology is. Uh, the weakest topology for which the projection maps are continuous, and then we are assuming that TOF is also continuous. So um, this is continuous. We can go ahead and apply continuity uh, in the following way. So um, by continuity,
see we can find ux, which is finite, um, such that if y agrees with x on the labelings of the elements of ux, right? So ux, again, is a subset of g. It's a finite subset of g. Um, then phi of y is equal to phi of x. Again, this is just continuity um, where the other the open set of interest is um, v is equal to the set of phi of x subset of the alphabet, uh, which we can do because um, the alpha uh, the alphabet's topology is discrete, so everything is open. So in particular, x is such a thing, or x is such a y, right? So um, we can go ahead and look at the union of x within the symbolic space over these intersections. And because each x that you use falls into one of these intersections, uh, in particular, it falls into the one intersection that it's associated with, then this union is just the entirety of the space. And since we are um, in a compact space, right? Um, note as well that AG is compact. Or the symbolic space is compact. This is where we're using that the alphabet is finite. The, uh, compactness means that if you have uh, any open cover has a finite subcover, right? So there exists an F, which is a subset of the symbolic space uh, finite, such that the union of X and F of this intersection. is still the whole space. And so now we have a finite number of elements of the symbolic space, which can be used to find these finite UXs to form a union that gives you the whole symbolic space. We have a candidate for our memory set. We take S equal to the union over X within F of these UXs. Now, supposing that Y and Z are within the symbolic space, I want to show that this is actually a memory set. So I'm going to suppose that they agree on the memory set S. Or the proposed memory set. They agree on the proposed memory set S, okay, make that not a delta, there we go. If we let X not be within F, be such that Y is within the intersection G within UX not, of the inverse of x, g. Since s is a strictly larger subset, uh, subset of the group than uh, ux naught, we have that, well, y restricted to ux naught is equal to z restricted to ux naught. They, they decided to start drilling something underneath me. Anyway. Um, 
So hence, we look at the images of the automaton evaluated at the identity element of the group. That's going to be the same thing as well. It's going to be the same thing as what happens to this x naught under the automaton at the identity of the group, which is going to be equal to what happens to z under the automaton at the identity of the group. And thus, there is a map me such that it goes from the restriction um, down to the memory set to the alphabet such that we know what the cellular automaton does to a point labeling of the identity. It takes it to me of whatever that point is restricted to s for every x within g. And so here, this is where we use equivariance of the map tough. So by g equivariance, if we were to go ahead and take some g within g, well, the automaton applied to g would be the same thing as the automaton, well, let's scratch that. So the automaton applied to x evaluated at g would be the same thing as the automaton applied to x evaluated at the product of g and the identity of the group, which is going to be equal to, well, a definition of that left shift action is going to be g inverse, right? That's what we want. G inverse is all the way back up the top. All right, so the left shift action is it just comes out front. Yeah, g dot x evaluated h is x of g inverse h, right? So all the way back down here, by definition of the left shift action, we'll get g inverse applied to tau of x and then evaluated at the identity. But that's the same thing by g equivariance of tau um, applied to g inverse acting on x and then evaluated at 1g. But again, we know what tau does at the identity map uh, or at the, ide uh, at the identity of the group g. We know what tau does at the identity of the group g and that's exactly, well, uh, mu of g inverse dot x restricted to s. And so by definition, um, tau is a cellular automaton with memory set s, which was that union of all of those uxs from before. So in particular, me is a local map or the map tau, which completes the proof of this theorem. So main thing to take away from the Curtis Headland Linden theorem is that the forward direction from one to two that a cellular automaton is continuous and g equivariant that doesn't break when your alphabet gets big um, that's true for every um, possible alphabet that you could choose so the issues come up when you go backwards and the major issue is that we had a compactness argument here so the counter example is going to go ahead and break that, um, that compactness argument. But before I get there, I want to go ahead and mention that um, the main application of this is for when people go ahead and they um, are constructing new types of symbolic dynamical systems, whether that be over a different group or over a different structure, and they want to go ahead and say what the factor maps are and describe those concisely. Um, so in the one-dimensional case, uh, this is used to say that the factors between um, your integer, your dynamics on labelings of the integers um, is given by sliding block codes. Um, and then that also goes for any ZD, right? You have some sliding block code 
um, through an integer lattice where you can do stuff. This is also used to define um, the correct factor maps for the case of tree shifts, where instead of having a group, you have a, uh, a tree and you're doing a similar thing. Um, some things I wanted to mention about this in particular, let's see where are we at? There's that, there is here, yeah. So for recent things that have been done with this particular uh, idea from uh, Pedlin back in 1969 and Richardson and the generalization since then, um, a recent developments with this stuff is uh, Sabotka and Gonzalez um, published in the Journal of Cellular Automaton in 2017 to um, extend this idea to a particular compactification of the space when you have an infinite alphabet to the case of working over a countable, uh, uh, working over a countable alphabet and working with monoids instead of just groups. Um, so monoids are just like a little bit weaker. Um, Sabotka and Gonsalves are, uh, as last I checked, are at the Federal University of Santa Carina in, say that's Brazil. Yes, no. Anyway, that's fine. Um, the particular compactification that's used in their argument is the Ott, Tom Forty, and Willis compactification of um, the one sided shift, which is A to the naturals. Um, and so they work with that in order to generalize to uh, the countable alphabet case over monoids. Um, in terms of more symbolic dynamic stuff with groups, um, one of the, the big, big names for this stuff is um, Kitchens. Um, he does a lot of stuff with symbolic dynamics in terms of doing work over a general group instead of just... Um, over the integers, which is if you look at journals, a lot of times there's a lot of like stuff published about symbolic dynamics in computer science journals. Um, so that's a thing. Anyway, um, so that bring that sort of fleshes out like this is this is this is still something that people think about and use to talk about spaces and new spaces uh, where we're, we're more interested in countable alphabets, which is a more recent thing. Um, and it all has also been generalized and extended to different compactifications of the space. Um, there's also, uh, I, I think it's the same people who did the compactification. Someone, someone in that area, the, that list of people that I mentioned, um, which I'll also put in the description once I may uh, take this stream and put it onto YouTube as well. Um, they, uh, extended the theorem uh, to be in, um, in if and only if in, in the case of, or the, in an equivalent statement in the case where the alphabet is continuous, and that was by changing the definition of what a cellular automaton was. Uh, and so I believe it's that you take, I'll have to double check this, but it's, I believe it's you take, you, you make the memory set not fixed, essentially. You make it variable based on the input of the automaton. Um, however, with that being said, the last thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and ex go through just briefly. I'm not going to go through the whole example. I'm just going to present it and leave it as an exercise um, to think about uh, the case where you have a countable alphabet and you have something where under the definition given in this talk of a cellular automaton, you have a continuous G equivariant map, which is not a cellular automaton. So... Here we go. Example. Let's do, let's do example. Let um, G be any infinite group. And What are they doing down there? Anyway, so and the alphabet A is going to just be equal to the group. Um, then define top of X is equal to uh, where is it at? 
it's yeah it's this thing so top of x at g is going to be equal to x evaluated at the action of g on whatever x originally had at g so you're you're pulling the symbol that you had at g and then you're shifting that by uh, by the element itself g and then you're going to that place and pulling out that symbol um, and this is for every x within a g for the symbolic space and g within g um, further there's something else i want to say about this yeah um, to see that this is a counter example We go ahead and take um, some H that is not the identity element of the group G. And then for all G, consider XG and YG within the symbol space such that xg evaluated at k is going to be equal to g h and 1 g in the following scenarios g if k is the identity h if k is equal to g and 1 g or the identity element of g otherwise and then y g of k is just going to be equal to g or 1g and it's g when k is equal to 1g and it is 1g otherwise so if you look at um so to see um so to see that this is a counter example of this thing you consider these two points and you compute tof of xg at 1g, the identity is going to be um, xg of xg of 1g which is equal to xg of g which is equal to h uh, while alpha of yg of 1g is going to be yg of yg at 1g which is equal to yg at g which is equal to 1g so since what uh, h was taken to uh, so yeah since h is taken to not be equal to 1g uh, in particular there does not exist a finite set f where you can specify enough information uh, such that that top of x only depends on f um, is the punchline there. And so that brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk through today. Um, so this was, again, this was just an expository talk to talk more about the Curtis Hedlund Linden theorem. Um, it's applied usually in a specific context, right? So, the, uh, so if you pick up a symbolic dynamics textbook, a lot of times um, it is it's stated as like um, a block map between um, a larger set of symbols to a smaller set of symbols or between two different sets of symbols um, and you can still derive the same things from this more general statement that I've given here in this talk um, but otherwise this is where I'm going to go ahead and cut the video that I'll on YouTube because that brings me to about an hour and yeah that was that was the talk um, 